You may find it hard to believe, but the guy you just saw singing on the videos was me in the band I was in called Axe Attack. Hi, my name is Andrew, and what I want to do is share with you some of my experiences in bands and in music, as well as the reasons why I eventually decided to give it all away and start a new life. How I managed to do this is part of the aim of this video. To begin with, I want to ask you to please watch this right through as I feel it contains material which you'll be able to relate to and identify with. Its purpose is not for me to glorify myself but to maybe help some of you from falling into the same traps that I did because I've been there and I've experienced it. Rock music, I would say, has been the biggest influence of my life. I was attracted by the glamour of it all the larger-than-life, almost superhero-type existence which the stars seemed to lead. And in time, it began to make an impression on me. I started to pay less and less attention to my schoolwork and more attention to what my rock stars were telling me. Their sayings and philosophies I started to adopt, to think about and live by. There comes a time in every young person's life when someone famous is bound to make an impression on them. It could be a rock star, a movie star, or even a sports star. Quite often this person becomes a role model and gets imitated by their young admirer. My idol was Gene Simmons from the rock group KISS. And this is me as Gene Simmons. I wanted to do everything he did to the point of starting a KISS lookalike band and playing their songs. I imitated him to the extent of learning how to breathe fire, even at the risk of permanently disfiguring my face. But the risk didn't matter to me as much as the thrill of knowing that I could do it. That's how blind I was. There's also the attention you get from others, which you enjoy. It makes you popular and boosts your ego. My case may have been a little more extreme than others, but it's still an eye-opening example of how much someone can be influenced by their rock idol. Eventually, I got serious about music. I decided it was what I wanted to do most. After leaving school, I started up a band with some friends who had similar views as me. In time, we began playing around town, doing our own songs. We really wanted to make it big, and we even got to the stage where we made TV appearances as you saw in the beginning. We also released a record. This is the self-titled EP that was put out in 1985. That's me on the right. At this point, being from an average Greek family background, I wasn't particularly religious, apart from the usual things which you did traditionally, like go to church at Easter and so on. I only had vague ideas about God. There were more interesting things to think about, like being a good bass player, growing my hair as long as I could, and getting famous. My ideas about God were being influenced by theories such as the Force in Star Wars, as well as by science fiction and fantasy films in general. I also got involved with Scientology for a while, which turned out to be a big fraud, and even joined a UFO society at one stage. All this helped give me a distorted picture of who or what God was. If anyone ever spoke to me about traditional views, I would think that they were old-fashioned and that they lacked modern wisdom. Little did I realise that my mind had been poisoned by all these new ideas. It wasn't until after a few years had passed, however, that I received an unexpected shock. Someone close to me died. And it affected me in a strange way. 
I started to think about God more seriously. It occurred to me, how can physical death be the end of existence? How can everything we live for, work for, all that we experience, the ups and the downs, the pleasures and pains of life, how can it be all for nothing? Think about it. It doesn't make sense. I thought about how we would all die one day, and more about God. I'd always believed that there was some form of life after death through various things I'd read, but I always had vague ideas about it. I wondered, if God is real, then he wouldn't fool around. Life and death would not be something vague and ambiguous like I'd thought before, but they'd have a definite purpose. Then through a series of events, some friends of mine became interested in Christianity. And through them, I got to see a video about rock music, which revealed things to me that I'd never noticed before, which I'll share with you in just a minute. I began reading up about Christ and Christianity myself, and found that the answer had been under my nose all along. The birth of Jesus Christ is what divides human history. If you don't believe that, just have a look at the date on your daily newspaper. If we have a look at a scale of history, we see that it's divided by BC, which stands for before Christ, and AD, which is Latin meaning in the year of our Lord. Notice it's Jesus who was at the center and not anyone else, like Alexander the Great, an Egyptian pharaoh or some important event. If Jesus was just a good man, as most people believe, then why does he divide the whole world into? Obviously, he was more than just a man. Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Christ. Easter is the celebration of his crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is a fact that sets Jesus apart from any other historical figure who ever lived. The accounts of his appearances are recorded for us by eyewitnesses to whom Jesus appeared alive over a 40 day period after his public crucifixion. He once even appeared before more than 500 people. Now ask yourself one question, why did Jesus die? He had such divine power that he could have crushed the Roman authorities when he was arrested or easily caused a revolt with his huge following, but he didn't. Jesus Christ is actually God himself in human flesh. Yet even though these things are under our very nose, how many of us actually remember that Jesus is the reason for the season? Christmas has become Santa Claus, presents and a time to get drunk. Likewise, Easter is about chocolate eggs and the Easter bunny. It's become so commercialized the meaning has been almost lost. It was soon after, realizing these things, that I first began to seriously pray. The weird thing about it though, was that as I was trying to focus myself on God, evil thoughts would automatically appear, as if out of nowhere. This demonstrated to me the existence of the devil, of good and of evil, something I'd never really distinguished between before. It's funny when you realize how easy it is to be evil and how hard it is to be good. It's easy to smoke, to get drunk, to get stoned, to rage all night, all this sort of thing. But it's hard not to. Or another example. To destroy a human being, it takes a second. Whereas to create one, it takes nine months. This is a universal law. Everything good requires effort. Whereas to be evil is easy. The source of all evil is Satan, who was originally created as an angel called Lucifer. Being the greatest among angels, his purpose was to praise and glorify God with music, which was his specialty. But because Lucifer was so beautiful and perfect, his heart got lifted up and he became proud. He began to desire the worship that rightfully belonged to God for himself. 
How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now you might ask, how can anyone in heaven rebel or have evil thoughts? I'll tell you why. Because when God created the angels, he made them perfect, but with a free will. Same as he created the first man, perfect, but with a free will. The reason for this is because God is love, and love is freedom. You may have heard the saying, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't, it never was. You can't force someone to love you, because then it's not love. That's why God didn't create robots, but beings with free will. Beings capable of obeying or disobeying Him. Lucifer chose to rebel, and he caused a third of the angels to follow him through their own free will. He became the first ever rebel in history. The result of this was that they were cast out of heaven. The fallen angels became demons, and Lucifer became the devil or Satan, which means the deceiver. His desire was, and still is, to receive worship for himself. Satan's greatest strength today is the fact that no one believes he really exists. This allows him to get away with anything he likes. Since his fall, however, his time is drawing nearer and nearer to an end, and he knows this. But Satan is wise, and he saved the best weapon to destroy people's souls with until last. And that weapon is the thing he can do best. Music. Now keeping all this in mind, let's take a look at the origin of rock. Did you know that right from the very start, the foundation on which rock music was built upon was rebellion? You know, you love it because your parents hate it. It's at the very core of rock and roll, and through the years it's been taken to new extremes. When Elvis first appeared on the scene, his hip movements caused an uproar. He was only allowed to be shown from the waist up on TV. This sounds ridiculous by today's standards. Imagine your parents finding Elvis shocking. It's laughable. Yet that's exactly what happened back then. Same thing with the Beatles. When they first appeared, the length of their hair was seen as an outrage. Yet today, they seem like little angels. Now when something stops being controversial and shocking, and becomes accepted in society, like the hip shaking of Elvis and the hairdos of the Beatles, that in order to shock and get a reaction once again, something new needs to be done. Eventually, people become conditioned to things which in the past would have been looked upon in horror. Today we've reached a stage where we even have bands openly glorifying the devil himself. That was a band called Venom, who are relatively unknown. If you're thinking, so what, that's just underground stuff, then let's have a look at some bands that are well known. This is a band called Motley Crue. Their 1987 album, Girls, 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 shot to the top of the American charts the week it was released and was a worldwide hit album. Have a listen to a part of the first track. <laughs> Now compare the lyrics we just heard with this Bible quote. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. The pentagram has long been a symbol associated with witchcraft and devil worship. It's a symbol Motley Crue also uses on their albums and videos. In fact, 
rock music today is full of satanic symbols and images. To the kids, it comes across as being cool. I used to absolutely love all this over-the-top blood and gut stuff. In fact, the sicker it got, the better. Only now can I see how outright satanic it all really is. Another band who has achieved huge success recently is Guns N' Roses. The album that did it for them is called Appetite for Destruction. One of the devil's titles in the Bible is The Destroyer. The cover shows the band members' heads drawn as skulls over a cross. Although the album contains four letter words right throughout, it was still a worldwide smash hit. Let's listen to some lyrics. I used to listen to this stuff almost religiously, but strangely enough, I never took any real notice of the lyrics. They didn't mean as much to me as the powerful sound of the guitars and the drums did. And there's something very spiritual about this, something I'll come back to soon. The Inner Sleeve features a rape scene where a girl has just been molested by a robot. The degradation of women is a favourite subject among rock bands. All these female fans dolling themselves up, trying to look good for their favourites, are just pieces of meat to a touring band. Yet all these girls would practically die for their rock idols out of devotion to them. If, however, they saw these same stars in the street before they became famous, saying the things that they sing about, they'd think, what a bunch of creeps. But put a guitar around them, put them up on stage, get them to make a record and a video, and the girls go crazy. The American band Poison keeps a computer list of groupies when they go out on tour and there are tens of thousands of women on the Poison groupie file. The members of the band have even installed a condom machine on their tour bus. So far I've only talked about heavy metal music basically and people seem to think that if they don't listen to this type of music then they're okay, that what they listen to is safe. But let me tell you something, the safe stuff is actually a lot more dangerous than what we've already seen. And the reason for this is because it's subtle. It doesn't come right out and say things about the devil like we saw before, but hides behind a mask. And Satan has many beautiful and clever disguises to mask his activities. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Today's dance music and top 40 is full of songs about sex and lust. Usually, it hides behind a mask of love, a mask Satan uses to really project sex. Kids reaching an age of sexual awakening are under heavy attack by all this lusty music, which pollutes their minds and gives them a false understanding of what real love is. The idea of sex only within marriage is something that's laughed at in today's society. But the reason God has put up a fence around sex in the Bible and surrounded it with commandments is because it's something special and precious. And what do you do with something precious? You look after it. You protect it. And sex is protected within marriage. But today it's become something cheap. It's been viciously attacked and exploited. And in contemporary music, the message is loud and clear. Now you might be offended by some of the material that will be shown, but remember, this stuff is on TV for everyone to see.
Even dancing today has become full of sexual suggestion. This massive sexual attack through music today has behind it as its mastermind, Satan, whose intention is to corrupt the younger generation and get them further and further away from God, and that's exactly what he's doing. There's no way that this sort of music would have even seen the light of day back during Elvis' time, but step by step, gradually, it's reached the stage that it has. Now when you think back, even before the 50s, music was something which occupied only a small part of people's lives. It was limited to celebrating an occasion or going out for the night or something. With the invention of a gramophone, however, people could play records at home. When radio arrived, it was even easier to have music in the house. Then came improvements in sound technology and tape players and stereos came out. With this came an invasion of music into our lives like never before. Now we've got videos and CDs as well. In fact, wherever you go, there is music. At home, in the car, at work, even in the shops. Now with the Walkman, you can even have it when you're walking down the street or going for a jog. I mentioned before how music is a spiritual thing. It bypasses the brain and speaks to the soul. The kind of music we listen to can influence us in ways we don't understand. A famous quote by Jimi Hendrix says, Music is a spiritual thing of its own. You can hypnotize with music, and when you get people at the weakest point, you can preach into the subconscious what we want to say. The rhythms and beats in rock have a mesmerizing, almost hypnotic effect to them. There have actually been studies which show you can pick up things subliminally, that is, without being mentally aware of them, and be influenced by them. Having been personally involved in all this, I can look back and see that there is a definite form of mind control going on, which is feeding the minds of millions around the world today. Thinking back, it had such a grip on me, I couldn't get by a single day without listening to my records. In today's society, music has become the great communicator. It shapes the fashions, the hairstyles and the attitudes of the young. But what message is it communicating? Songs today say, if it feels good, do it. But God says, if it is right, do it. If there is any doubt, stay away from it. This philosophy of do what you want, don't listen to what anyone else says, is one which really influenced me in my younger years. But it's really Satan's number one law, because it tells you not to recognize any authority, not even God. The more we listen to this sort of music, the more we are feeding our minds with thoughts that are directly in conflict with God's Word. It's no wonder that when kids have an argument with their parents, they say things like, Hey man, I don't like my parents. I can't get along with them. I can't wait till I move out with my friends. There's no doubt that there's a massive conditioning going on in the world today, and that the process will continue to snowball. But probably the biggest lie, and the greatest deception of all, 
is when rock stars put on a show of being religious. Artists who mix Christianity with lust and sexual imagery make examples of themselves to their fans, who copy them. I went through it. They make it safe to believe in God and at the same time to go out raging all night and to explore your sexuality. This is another one of the devil's masks. In recent years, discos and nightclubs have become increasingly popular. Young people flock to them like never before. I've collected some ads for some of these places that I'd like to show you right now. Okay.
Now is it a coincidence that there is always this preoccupation with God and the devil? If it was all just the product of man's imagination from the past, then why don't we just forget about it? Just leave it alone and move on with the modern times. We can't seem to do that. And that's because it's ingrained in the human conscience. The devil is laughing up a storm as he takes us for a ride and receives the worship he's always desired. Have a listen to what this particular rock historian has to say. You know, you might say, uh, what Jesus is to God. If Elvis was God, the Beatles would be Jesus. In terms of Christianity, you know. <laughs> rock stars have attained the status of saints in the eyes of the world today, especially among their fans. Satan is ingeniously substituting his counterfeit saints in the place of the real saints of God. The men and women who through years of struggle against the devil became holy and through God's grace were able to perform many miracles during their earthly lives and who continue to do so even after they have departed from this world. They are the real heroes. How tragic that they are ignored by the young generation today who instead look up to their rock idols like saints. The Bible specifically warns little children, keep yourselves from idols. It sounds like it's talking to today's generation. Something else I've noticed is that when someone's favourite rock artist is attacked or criticised, the fans immediately go on the defensive. But when their favourites mock God, no one gets upset. Where does their devotion lie? Study the lifestyles of your favourite rock stars. Research their lyrics. See what they're really saying. Now, I'm not against music altogether. Not all music is necessarily evil or of the devil. The whole idea originally came from God in the first place. It's what we do with our music that makes all the difference. How do you think we worship God? With music. Did you ever think about that? The church's services are full of psalms and singing. How is the devil worshipped? The same way, with music. Remember, he is the counterfeit God. Now finally, let's have a listen to an amazing song that virtually says it all. The song is by Barry Manilow and it's a good example of how the spiritual world interacts with and influences the physical world that we live in. The lyrics reveal the demented genius that's behind today's musical assault and just what a master of disguise he really is.
Rock music was the focus of my life for seven years. I put everything I had into it and directed all my energies towards becoming successful until I was faced with the reality of God's existence. I knew then it meant recognizing Him and living my life according to His commandments. But I was so deeply involved with the band and with what we were doing that I thought it would be impossible to break out of. But when I started praying and asked for God's help, I found things slowly started to change. Christ is true to His word when He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. At that point in time, the band had been going through a period of changes, and we were having some difficulties, which eventually, and quite unexpectedly, led us to break up. Something which took me completely by surprise. It was a powerful answer from God to my prayers. I knew He was there, and it was the best feeling in the world. For the first time, I could see the chains which the devil had wrapped around me unsuspectingly, and how I'd been a slave to his evil desires, even though I'd considered myself to be a Christian at the time. I saw that the kind of life I'd been leading really glorified the devil and not God. After years of wanting success, I'd finally found it. I used to think it meant being rich and famous, but when you take a look at the lives of the stars, they may have attained material riches, but their personal lives are a mess. Broken marriages, broken relationships, drug and alcohol abuse. And that's only because they're still looking for true happiness. Everyone has a space inside them which can only be filled by God's love. Other things only satisfy us temporarily. Our soul is the only thing we really own in this world, the only thing we'll take with us when we die. Everything else will be left behind. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The Orthodox Church is the church of my upbringing, the church where I was baptised. When I first came to God, however, I was attending an evangelical Christian Bible study, from which I learnt a lot, but from which at the same time I also began having doubts about the Orthodox Church. After a period of praying about it and asking for God's help, I met up with some people who could give me answers to the many questions that I had. After all, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, so how could they be so wrong? Soon I found to my amazement that the Orthodox faith is the most historically genuine form of Christianity in the world. It's been here for 2,000 years and can trace back its history to the Apostles themselves. I used to criticize the Orthodox because I couldn't understand the Biblical Greek that was used in the services, but now I respect them for it because they're the only ones who have preserved the original form of Christianity down through the ages unadulterated. The Bible says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by letter. Only the Orthodox Christian faith has maintained this commandment in its essence. It's like walking into a time machine every time you attend the services. And as long as you want to understand, you will. That's the key to it. Wanting to know. There are translations into English of all the services, as well as books which explain everything. Now here's an interesting quote from the Bible. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me?
The one who guides you to understand what the Bible says plays an enormous role. Orthodox Christianity has as its guide the fathers of the church. The holy men who since the very beginning of Christianity and down through the centuries have been of one mind in giving us the proper and correct interpretations of the holy scriptures. St. Paul says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. How true is this in today's world, where we have hundreds of other Christian denominations who have been in existence for a few hundred years or less, yet still claim that they have the truth? Don't be deceived. Orthodoxy is a priceless treasure which many of you have in your own backyard and you don't even realize it. The very word orthodox means the correct way. If you remember earlier, I mentioned how the angels have had their time of testing. Well, this is ours. Life is actually one big exam to see who will be worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, when the first man sinned through his own free will, that special relationship he had with God was broken and he became separated from him. The authority God had given him over all creation passed over to the devil to whom he had succumbed. That's why the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. But because God loved us so much, he was willing to come down as a sinless man and offer himself as a ransom for our sins and in turn lift the curse that was placed on us by the devil. Why didn't God just zap things back to normal? Because God is a righteous judge. The law was broken and the price had to be paid. Something that only God himself could do. Otherwise, man would have been lost. The devil has no claim over us now if we repent of our sins and live our lives trusting in Jesus as our saviour. One day we will all die. It could even be tomorrow. In the end, we will all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll have to give account for how we've lived our lives. Remember, we are responsible for our actions, not God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We are all called to be warriors for Christ, to stand up against the evil in this world and be soldiers of truth instead of blindly following the masses. Christ tells us, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. At first, I felt threatened by all this. I was afraid of losing what I had before. But now I can clearly see that in reality, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Think about it. Is it really worth forsaking God's love and His promise of eternal life? Christ said that no man could serve two masters, you can't have one foot in and one foot out. He sacrificed himself for us. Are we prepared to do the same for him? We must decide where we stand. And it all begins with a decision. This is serious. This is life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All God asks is for you to give him a chance. But all too often, people just aren't prepared to change. Even when they know what the truth is, they feel a sense of security in choosing to deliberately remain ignorant of the facts. But what happens when you get pulled over for speeding and you say you didn't see the signs? The law says ignorance is no excuse. The signs were there. The same applies here, except the penalty is far greater than we can ever imagine. Changes won't happen overnight. It's not an easy thing to do. It took me over a year to completely break free, only by praying to God for the strength to enable me to do it. And there is still a struggle. But that's just a part of everyday life for a Christian who's heading down the narrow path to salvation. A struggle which, in the end, is nothing compared with the joy of eternal life 
which Christ promises us. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I've broken away from rock music altogether now, and I mainly listen to classical or to church music, which I find great pleasure in. I hope I've made you aware of some of the dangers that lie behind most forms of popular music today. Remember, you're not getting this from the older generation or from someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. I've been on both sides of the fence. I've lived it and I've made my choice. All I can do now is pray that with God's grace, you'll be able to make the right choice too. Thanks for listening and God bless.